this is trigeminal. I'm going to take a little bit of time on trigeminal because trigeminal is rather important because it does a lot of things. Trigeminal is a massive nerve. So if we look back at this, what you'll see is trigeminal is here, absolutely massive nerve. Okay, it's one of the biggest nerves coming off the ponds at about three o'clock, and as it comes off the ponds, it heads this way, and then it comes to this point here, where it forms a bulb. This is a trigeminal bulb, and from this bulb, it then, this bulb is actually located and situated very close to all the foramina, where it's going to divide and send its branches from this bulb. Now if I just take you to the skull proper, that position there corresponds to this position corresponds to this position here. That's where the trigeminal bulb is going to sit. And from there, it's got ready access to launch its three branches immediately. So if we look in order, we have one, which is going to go through superior orbital fissure, which is the ophthalmic division, heading to the orbit, obviously. And then we have, and that's where the bulb's sitting, and then one straight through there. And then from where the bulb's sitting, it can send another one straight through here, which is foramen rotundum, which is the round foramen. And that's the V2, which is the maxillary division, which is going to be heading out towards the nose. And then from there, it's going to send one down here, foramen ovale, ovale V3. This is the mandibular division heading into that infratemporal fossa we referred to before. So that bulb is well located. All right. So from here, you'll be able to see, actually, mandibular division, maxillary division, ophthalmic division. And I can get you a bigger specimen just to show you that on as well, just to make sure. Take it. So again, here's my sphenoid bone, lesser wing of sphenoid, olfactory tract, um, ophthalmic, so optic nerve, and there's that trigeminal bulb, huge bulb, mandibular division, maxillary division, ophthalmic division, V1, V2, and V3. Okay. Let's talk about those in a bit more detail. So coming back to my coming back to my um, slide, there's the trigeminal bulb. Let's talk about V1. So it goes through the superior orbital fissure, as we explained. It's going to head into the orbit. So as it goes into the orbit, it's going to continue going, and it's going to have several branches. One is lacrimal, so it's going to head towards the lacrimal gland, which lives around the lateral aspect of the um, globe. You've got another one which is going to be su supra um, supratrochlear, which is going to head quite close to that pulley system on the medial side and head up. You've got another one which is supraorbital, and there it is heading up and then over the top of the orbit. Okay. And um, if I just show you that on this specimen I have here. So this is here is going to be your um, supratrochlear nerve. So the trochlea will be about here. And over here is going to be your supraorbital nerve, climbing up over here, supraorbital. OK. Right. So what's that going to do? Well, that basically, that's going to supply sensation to this area of V1. So that whole area is a distribution for sensation for V1. And you can see that area there 
tallies up with these nerves here. Okay. Next, I'd like to talk about the maxillary division. So maxillary division is going to go towards the maxilla. And the maxilla we know to be this bone here as the maxilla. So we have a division which comes out here. So remember we talked about before we talked about supraorbital foramen or notch and through there comes V1. The next one is the infraorbital foramen and there is the major branches of V2 which come out to supply the skin and surrounding area around here. So let's talk about this one. So this one is going to, going back to my slide, this one's going to go through foramen rotundum and as it comes out rotundum it's going to transverse that pterygo palatine fossa and then it's going to come out, it's going to come out through the inferior orbital foramen as the inferior orbital nerve and then supply the skin here. You've also got other branches which then descend and come through the incisive fossa and then can come and supply all these um, teeth of the upper arcade. You've also got branches which are going to drop down here and go through your greater palatine foramen also to supply the teeth and the hard palate. And that's your maxillary division. Maxillary division. So I'm just going to show you again here. If I thread in to frame and rotundum, and you see that there, that's been threaded into frame and rotundum. Oops, I'll just move that forward slightly, and I'll just grab that here. going to do now is just thread it so that it comes into, if I just turn that around and you have a look here, that's going to come in through, i just turn that so you have a look from the side, so if we have, can you see in there? You see it transversing the pterygopalatine fossa. You can see that there, just transversing the pterygopalatine. It would normally then go through, continue going through, and just see if we can encourage him through there. If you look through the orbit there, what's happening? So it will skim over, skim over the top of the inferior orbital fissure. And this would normally, I just want it to listen to me today at all, it would then come and poke out. We can almost see it coming out there. Can you see that? There we go come and poke its way out of the infraorbital foramen and emerge as the infraorbital nerve. That's your maxillary division V2. Going back to my diagram, we then have the mandibular division, which comes through foramen ovale, mandibular. As it comes out of foramen ovale, it descends into this area here, which was that infratemporal fossa, infratemporal fossa. So just to remind you again, the infratemporal fossa, if I put the mandible back on here, the infratemporal fossa I can easily define just by getting two fingers and inserting two fingers just like that. Two fingers. And you see how comfortable they sit in there. That's these two fingers. Two fingers from the top. Two fingers, two fingers there. 
Okay, and then I normally say what defines those boundaries. Again, you've got my stylus process at the back. There's my mandible there laterally. There's my lateral pterygoid medially. I've then got on the roof. Excuse me there, and the roof. This man boy. On the roof we would then have the sphenoid bone infratemporal surface um, as the forming the roof. And then the bottom basically descends down effectively into the neck, but we normally use this angle of the mandible as a cut off for how far down it goes. Right? And the most anterior aspect, we butt my fingers was butted up with were butted up against here, which is the maxilla. The maxilla. So this area here now is infratemporal fossa. And if you're looking at the infratemporal fossa, the most obvious hole associated with the infratemporal fossa, if I was to drop a line right in the middle of that space I've just defined, look where it's going. Straight in there. Foramen ovale, foramen ovale. So the foramen ovale really is the nerve of the infratemporal fossa, or the hole for the infratemporal fossa. And through there comes V3. Now, what happens to V3 when it comes out? Well, let's go back through to the diagram. As V3 comes out, it has two main parts it, it divides into. It has an anterior branch and a posterior branch. Okay. Now imagine this is the anterior here, and this bit here, these one, two, three little threads coming up here, are all the posterior. Okay. Now the general rule is the anterior branch, as it says here, does the chewing muscles. So this is the muscles of mastication. So the anterior branch is generally motor. The posterior branch is generally, and generally I say, generally sensory sensory for the posterior branch. Now the only exception to this rule, and this is the exam question clincher, the only exception to this rule is from the anterior branch, which is generally motor, there is one nerve which has to make a long track to the cheek, cheek we call buckle. So this is the long buckle nerve and it supplies just this patch of cheek just here and also the inside surface, the buccal surface of your cheek on the inside and some of these teeth, the molar and premolar teeth on the inside. So that's the exception to that rule. The exception to the rule for the posterior trunk is the posterior trunk is mainly sensory and here we have inferior alveola going into the mandibular canal and then popping out here is your mental nerve. Here we have lingual nerve coming into your tongue to provide sensation for your tongue. The exception to this rule is one nerve that comes down to a muscle that's going to secure the floor of my mouth, mylohyoid. Nerve to mylohyoid, it's motor that's coming off this mainly sensory posterior division. So this is how we break this up in general. The other nerve, which hasn't been labelled on this diagram, is auricular temporal. And as that comes out of foramen ovale and comes off your posterior trunk, it loops round the middle meningeal artery, which is heading up to come in through foramen spinosum quite close by. So it forms a loop superficially and a loop deep to middle meningeal. And auricular temporal is going to auricular for ear temporal for temporal region is going to supply the area behind the ear and around the temporal region for sensation as well. So I've spent quite a lot of time talking about the trigeminal nerve because of its three branches um, and here's the sensation pattern so V1 supplies this area, V2 supplies this area here and then V3 will supply this area around here. Okay. Looking at these muscles of mastication from that anterior branch, you've got the lateral pterygoid muscle, the medial pterygoid muscle, temporalis muscle, masseter muscle, and the dot 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 line just to the anterior belly of the digastric muscle, 
which is applied by V3.